Thank you. <clears throat> uh, welcome to this 20th Navi Endoscopic Spinal Surgery Internal Web Symposium. Last month, we discussed about the pathophysiology of the sinovertebral and basilar neuropathy. In connection, with, in connection with that presentation today, we are having the presentation by two eminent uh, endoscopists and pain physicians, uh, Dr. Pang Hong Hu and Manish Raj. Uh, before starting the presentation, uh, I would like to welcome all panel, panelists and would like to introduce our presenter. First, Wu Pang, he is the associate professor in Gong Lu Lin School of Medicine. He is a member of the Singapore Spine Society, permanent member of the Asia Pacific Spine Society. He is the member of AO Spine. And he has achieved many honors and awards. Among them, recently, he is the winner of the Best Paper Award for 2019 Korean Minimal Invasive Spine Society, Surgery Society. And he is the winner of Best Oral Present Award in Hoche Road Spine Congress 2020. He has done his fellowship in spine from the AO Spine and also from the Nanuri Gongnam Hospital. And also he has done AO Spine North American Fellowship in the Complex Spine Surgery. He is the reviewer and editor of, of journals like Neuro Spine Journal, Old Neurosurgery, BMC Muscular Disorder, Jemist, Medicine Journal, Asian Journal of Neurosurgery, and so on. And he, is a, he has published many research in the prestigious journals. And he has, he is also a writer of the textbook. He has a chapter in the textbooks as well. I would like to welcome Professor, Associate Professor, Assistant Professor Pang Hong Wu to present his presentation. Uh, the topic of his presentation today is his presentation is uh, endoscopic radiofrequency treatment for chronic dysogenic back pain. Dysogenic back pain is very new sense. Let's invite him to talk on that RF treatment for the chronic dysogenic back pain. Okay. Dr. Hu, please proceed. Yeah, please uh, allow me to share the screen. Thank you, Dr. Bai Park, for your kind oh. introduction. Thank you, Prof. Kim, Pai Park, uh, Manish, panelists, and Nanori scientific team for the invitation to speak on the role of endoscopic ablation in lumbar spondylosis. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Professor Yu Song Kim, who has imparted most of my endoscopic knowledge in, uh, and uh, have brought me to the wonderful world of endoscopy in spine surgery. I practice in Jurong Health, which is a regional health system, Together with National University Hospital, we form the National U University Health System. We look after the western part of Singapore. In my hospital, we look after about 12% of Singapore's population. Uh, in 2020, I did about 50% of my cases at endoscopic spine surgery, and progressively over the years, I've increased my percentage of the surgery to 70 to 80%. I do both uniportal and biportal endoscopic spine surgery. Today, my talk uh, focus on touch on a few points in extension of Professor Kim's last week's wonderful uh, last month's wonderful talk. I'll be extending on the pathophysiology of the degenerative this disease and its uh, degenerative cascade. I would like to highlight on the posterior primary ramus and its role in pain and the neurotization of sinovertebral and basic vertebral nerve. I will touch on first the percutaneous approaches to to come uh, to the posterior primary ramus in particular medial branch, and then subsequently touch on about um, endoscopic approaches to sinovertebral and basic vertebral nerve. As we know, degenerative disc disease is one of the leading cause of chronic back pain, which in turn is one of the highest um, cause of the disability in patients presenting to spine patients all over the or spine surgeons all over the world. Despite the geographical changes in healthcare, and political advancement and geopolitical advancement, the pattern of lower back pain has been the same or similar from 1990 to 2010. 
and currently in 2020. Among the various uh, spinal condition, degenerative disc disease is the commonest cause of lower back pain globally. There are a number of causes of degenerative disc disease in the molecular level. We can divide them into non-traumatic, traumatic, and other environmental causes. Non-traumatic degeneration is triggered by the decrease in nutrients distribution over time as we age, coupled with changes in the composition of the extracellular matrix. Chondrocell light, light cells necrosis in the nucleus pulposus occurs in accelerated rate as we age. Its necrosis process leads to the cartilage collagen interface degradation and subsequent formation of syndesmophile and cal calcification in the adjacent vertebra. Traumatic degeneration can be one-off high-energy trauma incident, like a slip disc, or in a micro trauma accumulated over time, which leads to mechanical annular fusion and nucleus damage. Other environmental causes such as genetics, aging, smoking, repetitive mechanical movements over time leads to decreased nutrients avail availability, structural changes, inflammation of the intervertebral disc, and subsequent neovascularization and neo innovation of inflamed degenerated disc, which subsequently leads to back pain. As we know, the degenerative cascade made popular by Kokadi and Willis in 1970s. He described the degenerative cascade as a model to help explain the normal changes that all this had. He postulated that torsional injury leads to the disc and subsequently degenerated disc uh, disease occurs in three general stages. First, as a dysfunction, Small circumferential tears in the outer layer of the disc grow inwards after injury, and hence leading to mobility uh, limitations. Subsequently, as the inner material of the disc begins to protrude outwards, the nucleus, as a result, leads to the decrease in disc height, which leads to relative instability. Finally, as we mentioned just now, osteophytes form the margins of the disc and the changes in the disc become more fixed and the vertebral column segments restabilize and the dysfunction subsides. Further on, papers have suggested the treatment strategy has been simplified to dysfunction uh, stage, which is the disherniation and the potential uh, treatment is discectomy. When it's destabilized in the causing abnormal motion, spondylolisthesis and uh, instability pain, fusion is one of the treatment options. Restabilization, however, with some stability in the segmental spine may suggest that laminectomy is one of the treatment with or without fusion. This is a slide adopted from Prof Kim's previous talk. The posterior primary ramus is involved in the deep somatic pain as it anatomically passes through the mammillo accessory ligament and passes between the intermammillary fascicle and the mammillo steroid fascicle. This progressive damage to uh, intervertebral disc in this degeneration leads to decrease in this height, loss of this height leads to also changes in the spinal stability and leads to micro subluxation of the healthy disc and uh, subsequently joint dysfunction. All these segmental micro -sublux subluxation leads to pathological changes in facet joints. Uh, and uh, capsular contracture and hypertrophy, increasing the stiffness of the spinal segment and subsequent muscular contracture of the various smaller muscles in the multipillars, which again leads to more discogenic back pain. This is a viscous cycle and eventually leads to the buckling of ligamentum favorum as the this height collapses, facet hypertrophy, and leading to spine overall effect of spinal stenosis. Also, as due to this micro subluxation, tightening of contracture of the capsule and on the dorsal primary ramus, as well as the ventral primary ramus, both sinovertebral nerve, facial vertebral nerve, and the posterior primary ramus, which supply the facet joint, can be affected and leading to chronic pain. There's various pain mediators, sorry for the slide being very busy. That is uh, stimulated by sensitization of the lumbar and the vertebral disc. Generally, after uh, the inflammatory markers are raised, immune cell migration leads to a vicious cycle of cytokine secretion, which in turn leads to more uh, inflammatory neutrophils proliferation and nerve ingrowth and sensitization of spinal nerve, which leads to the lower back pain. 
And as we mentioned earlier, after traumatic or non-traumatic events, these my macro and microscopic changes in the disc eventually leads to degeneration and sensitization of the lumbar intervertebral disc. These microscopic changes in the disc triggers even more cytokine secretion and become a vicious process. The cytokine signals increase in uh, further downstream effects and sensitization of spinal nerves, uh, which leads to lower back pain. Now, before we apply um, radio frequency ablation or other thermal energy, as well as giving medication to treat pain uh, as a pain precision, the spinal segment, we, we need to understand the anatomy of sinovertebral nerve. Sinovertebral nerve was first described by Dr. Hubert von Luschka in 18, 1850. There's a bilateral innervation of sinovertebral nerve in every vertebral level. It innervates the posterior longitudinal ligament, vertebral body, and pedicles. It also gives rise to branches to the intervertebral foramen through the anterior spinal canal, uh, forming a neuroanastomosis. Study shows that sinovertebral nerve innervates posterior annulus fib and fibrosis, as well as that of the end plate. Sinovertebral nerve receives contribution to from two main sources. One, the somatic supply comes from the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve which uh, also has a di con direct from the ventral ramus of spinal nerves or directly from the spinal nerve itself. There's also contribution from the uh, gray ramus communicans, which provides the autonomic supply. As you can see from this, uh, the, uh, as the nerve root goes out, gives rise to posterior and anterior primary ramus, which uh, join as a recurrent branch in uh, some of the contralateral approach, we actually can see the recurrent branch. This recurrent branch, together with the sympathetic nerve uh, supply, give rise to the sinovertebral nerve, which goes around supplying the end plate and the disc, as you can see from this picture here. Now, we have talked about the uh, ventral ramus and uh, giving rise, together with the sympathetic chain, the sinovertebral nerve. The posterior pr uh, primary ramus, uh, which is as shown here, runs and traverses through the fibro osseous canal bounded by the accessory process, mammillary process, and the mammillary accessory ligament, which exists through the intermammillary fascicle and the mammillosteroid fascicle of the multifidus muscles, as shown here. This uh, posterior primary ramus supplies uh, through the medial branch onto the facet joints. This classic description of the, both the sinovertebral nerve and posterior primary ramus are important somatic branches of proprioceptive and nociceptive fibers, which uh, supplies to the spinal uh, segment and its pain fiber. Now, where is basic vertebral nerve? So, uh, sinovertebral nerve takes a course through the superior part of the Cambin's triangle and it subsequently underwent, goes through. The um, sinovertebral nerve subsequently give rise to the basic vertebral nerve upon entering through the central vascular foramen into the vertebral body, as shown here. This basic vertebral nerve is important as it gives rise to the branches to supply different parts of the end plate, as shown here on a surgical card of the uh, schematic diagram. As you can see in a normal disc, uh, there's no, there's less fiber and less sensitization as well as less uh, neovascularization around the basic vertebral nerve. As depicted in the right picture under degenerated disc in an article also written by Prof. Kim and Nitin uh, and uh, Song Yong Tang, there is a significant increase in the uh, fiber of the basic vertebral nerve under degenerative condition. So this concept of uh, anatomy in sinovertebral and basic vertebral nerve as well as that of the um, medial branch have given rise to many of the pain procedure. Of course, generally, pain procedure is usually recommended as the earlier part of the conservative or semi-conservative conservative treatment prior to uh, decompression and fusion surgery, as we can see here. In, my, uh, in our article that we, I wrote with Prof. Kim and uh, Professor Zhang, 
we uh, wrote a general letter of management of intervertebral disc disease in an ideal scenario in this scientific journal so that we people understand that actually um, there is a kind of a progression before we go for fusion surgery. Of course, as a scientific journal, we do highlight that there are some gene therapy, cell therapy, and growth factor therapy, but those are under investigation. These treatments, as we can highlight here, are the more common options in treatment for back pain. So this fix is quite a well-known procedure. It's still being performed these days by many surgeons around the world. This is a thermal procedure to reduce the volume by evaporating the this tissue. And also at the same time, it can uh, burn off the sinovertebral nerve fibers that supply to the edges of the annulus posterior. You can use a small forcep to remove protruding or prolapsed tissue using microsurgical forceps. This is a picture of uh, basically a protruding um, disc, which we have performed um, this fix. No? As we can see here, we talk in the Cambridge Triangle, we locate through the rest of this fragment and then put, provide the radio frequency ablation. We tend to do that um, uh, for six seconds uh, with the radio frequency uh, for six times in the nucleus and four times at the annulus at a lower energy. Further on, there are clinical studies to target the basic vertebral nerve. And in this uh, clinical study produced, I mean, published in the Spine Journal in 2019, they show that there is significant uh, improvement, although it is a study with uh, some conflict of interest, that they target the basic vertebral nerve through the where we particularly where we insert the pedicle screw uh, into the region of the um, region of the basic vertebral nerve. And uh, they supply energy through this uh, uh, currently FDA accepted intracept system um, to provide uh, energy to uh, basically uh, radio frequency ablates the uh, basic vertebral nerve. And in that study, as you can see, the scar in, uh, after the ablation, the patient did well in terms of VAI, VAS and ODI score. Now go on to the topic that we are very interested in and endoscopic with radio frequency ablation. This takes part uh, in the knowledge that we have obtained through the anatomy and also in earlier on the percutaneous ablation to the real endoscopic procedure. We all know what are the reasons we are doing endoscopy. Be it transforminal in contralateral interlaminal or stenosiscope, we can see better, we preserve motion segment, we preserve soft tissue and bony tissue, uh, we can have mobility of equipment and scope. Uh, we tend to have less anesthetic, short hospital stay, and decrease perioperative pain and achieve our targets. I think Prof Kim is one of the leaders in uh, uh, endoscopic radio frequency ablation for sinus and basic vertebral nerve. In this article published uh, in 2018 um, by the same group that we highlighted just now uh, by Prof Kim's group, he targeted a patient who has a post herbert uh, uh, hepatic uh, neuropathy of sinus vertebral nerve. And through that, he realized he found out a few uh, uh, observations. They tend to have severe adhesion uh, adjacent to the area of sinus vertebral nerve with neovascularization as well. And after he applies the radio frequency of patient ablation, the patient did well post hoc. Further on, we published in a case series and uh, described the anatomy and pathophysiology of uh, sinus and basic vertebral nerve. We grade them into three grades, with grade one, no neovascularization or adhesion, grade two, with neovascularization, no adhesion, and grade three, both. We find that uh, most of the patients with significant back pain, understandably, uh, to be presented to us for radio frequency ablation treatment, have a grade two or three, meaning they have either neovascularization or adhesion, or both, in, in the region of sinus vertebral and basic vertebral nerve. These are some intraoperative images. They are particularly next to the disc and uh, there's significant neovascularization. And after, well, as we apply radio frequency ablation over that region, um, they tend to have twitching of the buttock and sometimes even the leg. But we are very sure that it's not, uh, we are not applying radio frequency ablation on the, directly on nerve root as they are retracted out of our palms way by the working retractor. Interestingly, after we completely knew uh, a, a radio frequency ablate the area that is neovascularized and adhesion issue and uh, adhesionalysis performed, the Kim's twitch also stopped. 
none of the patients have uh, neurological deficits and uh, the patients do well postoperatively in terms of pain, pain score and ODI as well as MATLAB score. This is uh, uh, how we describe in our uh, literature. So now is one of the few uh, longer bigger series uh, retrospective study. We would like to uh, watch for the space in the future in the literature for uh, more of such studies on endoscopic radio frequency ablation. These are the various key switching points uh, we mentioned about when we apply the radio frequency ablation, as you can see mostly adjacent to the pedicle, which is pretty understandable from the branches of the center vertebral nerve. And uh, this, key, this uh, twitching point uh, tends to uh, subside after we have gotten rid of by radio frequency ablation the base and of the neovascularization adhesion. So how do we approach uh, endoscopic radio frequency ablation? We can do it transforminally. We can do it uh, um, through the interlamina. And again, we can do it contralateral as we can show in one of the earlier, case, uh, earlier papers. Just to highlight, I also perform endoscopic um, video branch radio frequency ablation. This example is a 50 year old security guard. He was previously very active, but he has worsening back pain or extension. There's minimum discomfort on flexion. So I also tend to prone them. In the prone position, I palpate for very, very painful facet. First, I palpate the uh, soft tissue, the muscle gently in moderate strength. It tends to be not too painful when I palpate deeper on the facet joint um, of the particular affected level. They may be in more pain and uh, they will describe the pain very much similar to the pain they, that occur when they do extension of their spine. We tend to do a facet block prior to do endoscopic radio frequency ablation or percutaneous radio frequency ablation in that matter. In this patient, he chose the endoscopic one. The literature shows that endoscopic radio frequency ablation tend to, tends to last longer and, uh, in terms, and tends to have a more effective uh, pain score decrease compared to percutaneous method of uh, radio frequency ablation in the same points of the video branch. It's my skin incision point, which tends to be uh, two cm away from the transverse process lateral facet junction, right, where the video branch tends to be there. Through the endoscopic approach, we look out for the mammary process in the lateral margin of facet joint, and uh, we tend to apply the region about six seconds or six times, and then this uh, video showing how we do it. Uh, this is a left side approach. We repeat that for L5 as well, but um, putting the scope, we tend to see the lateral get rid of the soft tissue. We clearly, I, we can use the X-rays to confirm, apply radio frequency of the lateral facets. Uh, I find L5, L5 S1, uh, that video branch. Okay, uh, in the next uh, case in scenario, we can see that better. Radio frequency of later over there. I tend to apply, to be honest, um, from the top of the white area. Uh, I do not really buy, I do not violate the facet joint and uh, segment. One incision, uh, in, if we do a L3, L4, L5, we can use one incision at L4 and we cannot uh, flex the table, we extend the table, put them on the Jackson table or pull axis table without flexion, then the, the um, three action position so that you can minimize the skin uh, incision. Uh, the TP is quite easily identified and it's a good safe stock endoscope. I tend to use a 30 degree transformer endoscope. 171 uh, centimeter in length and later. Uh, in the next case, you see that we also, I also use an interlaminar endoscope, which is 15 degree. However, diameter, we can put in a larger radio frequency ablator and tends to be more efficient. If you have a lot of levels of use, usage of endoscope. Again, uh, I go from the top to the bottom of the uh, facet uh, cost of the video branch. I think the advantage and uh, probably one of them as um, better VAS score as uh, mentioned by some of the studies is because of the uh, good frequency ablation of the entire medial branch course. So this is a patient post-op. This imagine pre-op is, uh, he shocked me two weeks later when I wouldn't check, he said that yes, it's pain-free. Sometimes uh, I'm, I'm really surprised there by how well they did post-op. So this is a case, a uh, 38 year old manual worker. I, find, I tend to find that these patients, uh, a lot of them are manual worker. And then they have a pain score eight for six months. They're not better with analgesia. They're not better with a pain specialist referral. Uh, not very remarkable this, they have an uh, annular tear with a minor small, small nucleus protrusion, but they are in a lot of pain. 
Um, so uh, this is an interlaminal approach and I target the sinus particular nerve as well as the some facet hypertrophy and uh, facet fluid. So I'm also doing radiofrequency ablation for the facet, as you can see here. I target the ALA and the L5TP facet junction. This is a video. Um, so you can see that uh, I, I use the interlaminal scope this time. So you can see that I use the 45 degree radiofrequency ablator, which is pretty much more even. I'm just trimming a little bit of facet. It tends to be a bit hypertrophic. Uh, before I do a splitting technique uh, that uh, popularized by Prof. into and there's quite a significant uh, abundance of adhesion and radio frequency uh, and, um, and neovascularization over the pedicle and the lower of the space. It is uh, quite typical, I would say it's a grade three uh, in terms of the, our team's grading. So as you can see, there's a small gap um, of the protruding disc. Um, this video wasn't highly edited, so it can be quite, uh, it can be a bit draggy, sorry for that. But I think I can show you clearly what we do in this surgery. So I, I, I managed to uh, perform a discectomy to decrease the disc bound that's uh, protruding. But I feel that this, in this patient is more of the sinovertebral and basic vertebral neuropathy that causes pain, uh, rather than that of the prolapse disc irritating the nerve, because uh, on the MRI, that isn't a huge amount of this pressing on the nerve. Nevertheless, there's a loose fragment that we retrieve, as you can see from here. So after we retrieve the disc, uh, we do annuloplasty. This is again uh, popularized by, uh, and well described by Prof Kim and his uh, team. So we now target the uh, Kim's point. As you can see, we start from point C in the diagram, the pedicle, uh, quite it's adjacent to the upper end plate, uh, lower end plate. And then we move on to point B now. And as we are doing this, I can I can show you the video, but the buttock is twitching. And obviously the nerve is out of harm's way. And it can be understood because there's a recur recurrent branch of the somatic branch from the existing nerve root that uh, join together with sympathetic nerve that uh, form an anastomosis with the existing branch. And uh, hence, there might be some uh, reaction causing sciatica or pain going down the leg. Uh, as we perform radio frequency ablation, ablation in sinovertebral nerve, this kind of pain pattern can go can be uh, much more improved. So as you can see, uh, I'm now um, uh, near the point B or, or, or point A of the Kim's twitching point and the buttock indeed twitch. And then we move on to lower parts of the uh, point A, and then we perform radio frequency ablation at this area. Generally, uh, once all the adhesion point as well as that of the neovascularization points are eliminated, then the Kim's twitch generally either decrease or stop. Um, this case, because uh, I, I did under general anesthesia, I can do under epidural anesthesia as well. For the previous case under security guard, I do it under local anesthesia and sedation. For radio frequency ablation of the also primary ramus, I tend to do under LA sedation. I do transforminal root of uh, sinus and basic vertebral nerve as well, uh, ablation, radio frequency ablation. So this this part uh, as uh, that that uh, this part is basically uh, applying to dock at the ALA and then uh, applying radio frequency ablation of the medial branch. I find in the ALA, the medial branch are more prominent, as you can see after we radio frequency ablate, again from the top to bottom of ALA, uh, we use an interlaminal scope so we can use a more effective radio frequency ablator. It's a larger in shape to cover more area. Uh, I, I, I think that this is really efficient, um, but it requires a larger inner diameter scope to perform this, because this, uh, I think, is about 4 mm. It's too big for a transformer scope. Uh, you can see the S1 of the a S1 ALA. And then the alpha S1 joint. And you walk along the ALA doing radio frequency ablation. And as you apply the radio frequency ablation uh, on the neovascularized tissue, you find the well definition of the uh, of the uh, dorsal primary ramus, the medial branch, eventually. As you can see here, look quite close to what is described in the textbook. And I can show you this and it's later on. I will show you a schematic diagram. It looks really exactly like how the schematic diagram looks like of the medial branch. And um, so generally, after the whole en entire course of the medial branch, which is uh, along the ALA, is, uh, and of course, uh, along the TP in the higher level lumbar spine, L345, uh, generally the pain does get better in uh, most of the patients that apply that too. However, I must admit that uh, doing an uh, endoscopic radio frequency ablation takes uh, a lot more time than percutaneous radio frequency ablation. So, in a busy practice, it can be a hindering factor. But the incision is not big, and the uh, overall effect is uh, long lasting. It can be a potentially uh, one of the treatment options that we can think about. Okay, sorry for my lengthy video. I, I think I will stop here. I invite any questions.